Okay, welcome back. Episode 131 of Chaotically Intolerant. Um, really awful wildcard weekend, I feel like. Just no real good games, except for the Lions-Rams, obviously. Um, but a lot of blowouts. Not a great product for the NFL. No, I mean, you had your home cooking, 5-1 and one for the home teams. Um, you had... Just some teams that looked like they didn't belong. The Pennsylvania teams in particular looked – I mean, you know, give the Steelers a little credit. They they kind of chipped away. I think the Eagles looked worse than the Steelers did. They looked more yeah. overmatched than Pittsburgh. Um, Cleveland, you know, that was a surprise, obviously, to both of us with the – with the uh, the, the, the uh, just the level of blowout that game turned into and um, – you know, I mean, Green Bay crushing Dallas. I mean, we we mm-hmm. expect the Cowboys to fail in the playoffs, but that game was – and forget what the final score said. I mean, it was 32 points at one point in the fourth quarter. So there were some um, – there were some just – some mismatches. There were some teams that just didn't show up to play really, and uh, you, you expect better in the postseason. Yeah, you, you expect – better showing from some of these teams getting, getting to this stage. You've played 18 weeks of football prior. Um, so it was a little surprising to see some of these, you know, teams we thought were going to be better laying eggs, especially, you know, Cleveland and Dallas. Yeah. Um, we can jump into the Cleveland game. Um, Mm. just a, a a horrendous miss by us. Um, more, more me, I would say, um, hold on. The ESPN is playing another ad in my ears. Um, But, I mean, uh, we, we forgot about Flacco, um, the other side of, of Joe Flacco and, and the turnover machine that he really can be. Um, and I think, I think that injury was a lot more impactful for Miles Garrett than we really expected. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the way the game started, there was no indication that the blowout was coming. And we had, you know, a 14-10 Cleveland lead and, you know, the Browns were finding some big plays, but... Again, the turnover bug, and like you said, the defense. I mean, that to me, okay, so take out the two pick sixes, and you're still looking at a Cleveland team that statistically was the best-ranked defense in terms of yards, giving up 31 points to a rookie quarterback. Granted, he's a really good rookie quarterback, but, you know, postseason, um, you know, Houston took on that role of the underdog, even playing at home, and and uh, they just took it to the Browns. I don't know. I yeah. mean, I – but you look at the end of the day, at the end of the season, I should say, the job Stefanski did with all the the injuries the Browns had, and losing Nick Chubb, uh, and you know being down to Flacco as a fourth string quarterback, and and having obviously Garrett injured at this point in the season, um, that's not the Cleveland Browns that we've grown accustomed to. We we you, know, you would think, given the Browns' history and all those injuries this year, that they would have been a four or five win team. So for mm-hmm. them to have won 11 games, even with this disappointing end, I think it was a great season for the Browns. They just need to figure out what they're going to do at quarterback next year. You know, if they're going to keep Watson. Yeah. I, uh, I, the one thing that I, I will say, I just didn't even know um, was how bad the Browns defense is on the road. Cause I knew, I knew they got shellacked against the Colts. I mean, the Browns won that game, but their defense was shellacked, but there was also some turnovers in that game um and like i think watson was like their biggest problem in that game at the beginning uh but i was not aware of just how horrible they have been on the road consistently Mm -hmm. yeah Um, and they they showed that this week i mean it it was it was 24 14 at halftime and you know it 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 felt like a game and houston was going to get the ball at the end of the half and you thought maybe they're going to double dip and then cleveland gets the stop at the half Right. And you think, okay, that's what they needed. They needed the stop. They fell into a little bit of a hole, but Flacco's going to dig them out. And then the back-to-back interceptions happen, and the game is literally like that. It's over. Like, there's, there was no ch- almost no chance at that. It was 38-14. I mean, that, that's how quickly this game was able to switch. Um, so this was, this was the game of, of two of the team of destinies, too, it felt like. It was unstoppable force versus immovable object and and the Texans clearly they had a lot more destiny on their side I think yeah I mean like from a from a yardage standpoint it wasn't I mean if you just looked at the 
actual stats. I mean, Cleveland had more first downs. And I understand, you know, maybe garbage time as you get into the later in the second half. Mm-hmm. You know, the art, Houston only outgained them by 32 yards. And the, the uh, uh, you know, of course, the yards per play was egregiously different, you know, 8.1 to 4.6. But it just, it it didn't feel like it was so much a blowout until those pick sixes. And if you took those out, I, yeah, I, I, Cleveland was three and five on the road this year. I understand that Houston getting a healthy Stroud is, you know, it makes them a different team, you know, when they were struggling there with Case Keenum. Um, and I, you know, Houston, <laughs> when you've got a young quarterback and you've got nothing to lose, you become dangerous. Just ask the Cowboys against Jordan Love, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I, I guess actually let's go to the Cowboy game um, after, you know, because uh, I, I feel like Dolphins Chiefs was just so boring, too. I, I want to give credit. I don't think a lot of people are really talking about just how impressive da- uh, Green Bay going into Dallas was. I mean, this is the youngest team in football. Jordan Love, he really, I think he only had like five elite games like that we would consider elite this season. And they came out and just punched Dallas in the mouth. And Dallas had no response. I mean, what, I don't even know where the Cowboys go from this. They've How many times have they done this now where they have an elite? I mean, they were they were a great home offense, too. Like, this is at home in Dallas. Dallas doesn't lose at home, especially like this. I don't care about the garbage time, t- the garbage time stuff. It, it was really like 48 to 16. That's That's really what it was. And this yeah. is... This is this Packers team could win the Super Bowl, I think, realistically. We'll come back to that in a second. And just looking, if you actually look at the Cowboys' recent playoff games, you know, they've lost playoff games. They lost at home to the 49ers a couple of years ago. They have not had one this bad since Favre carved them up with Favre really? with the Vikings in the 09 divisional round. That was 34 to 3. Most of their playoff losses have actually been more of the heartbreaking variety. They had. The, you know, two against Green Bay, the Des Bryant catch, and then the third and 20 to set up the field goal in one. And they had, you know, close loss to the Niners the last two times they faced them. And, yeah. um, you know, lost. I'll never, to the- for, I'll never forget the Dak running up the middle and they're yeah, trying to spike the it. Yeah, runs out. Yeah. And, you know, they had a, you know, they hung with the Rams to a certain extent in 2018 when the Rams went to the Super Bowl. And, um, you know, they had the heartbreak, a couple of games with Romo, the one where he dropped the snap. But so this is the first time really outside of that, that 34 to three game I mentioned in, in the 09 playoffs that Dallas has just been embarrassed in a postseason yeah. game. And so they had been dominating at home all year. And I like what Michael Strahan said. I was happy to catch a little bit of the OT after the game. And, you know, you talk about all the media pressure on Dallas and all the sort of, you know, the coverage and the expectations. And it kind of feels like, what Strahan was saying is it feels very theatrical. You know, it feels like these guys are not are, are, are like putting on a performance rather than just going out and playing football and that everything they do is so magnified and glamorized and it doesn't need to be because the Cowboys aren't America. I mean, they might be America's team in terms of fandom and everything, but in terms of winning and success, the postseason, they're, they're, they're on the lower end because of their inability to even get to an NFC championship game since 95, right? Um so yeah. for Dallas, I think, you know, look, Jerry Jones is the problem, but he'll never admit it. It's just keep firing the coaches, keep firing yeah. quarterbacks or players, whatever, but it's it's him. Is Jerry Jones on a Jim Irsay level of ownership where he's actually preventing great coaches from going there? Yeah. I mean, Shane Steichen, we don't, we don't know what is going on right now, uh, or, you know, for his future at least for, for the Colts. I mean, we think we have it. But the last like really great Colts coach that we saw was Dungy. I mean, Jim Caldwell took him to a Super Bowl, but he really wasn't successful with, with Manning. And then Pagano was, I mean, he was he was a mid level coach. I think he was much better than than we remember him. Um, and then obviously the Frank Reich situation. Uh, but I, I feel like Jerry Jones is is in that same level with Jim Irsay. They're not as bad as Dan Snyder. I, Dan Snyder is a whole nother league. Same thing with uh, David Tepper. There, there's those guys are the worst or bottom of the bottom of the rung. But I think right there, right above them, is Jerry Jones, Jim Irsay. Um, I'm not really sure who else 
you could really put in there? Who's what other owner is really? Well, it would have been Dan Snyder, but yeah, Dan Snyder, but he's gone. Josh Harris seems like he's doing pretty damn good, actually. Yeah, yeah. There's so far. There's very few owners that in in, in football. There's owners in other sports, and I'm an Orioles fan, so I feel that way about the Angelos family. But I think going flipping to to Green Bay. I mean, yes, it being a seven. Look, this is a team that's won a Super Bowl as a six seed. Um, it's a franchise that you know that wins in the playoffs for the most part. Yeah, I mean, obviously you can't win every year, but they've they have won some Super Bowls. They have had some really deep postseason runs, and they've got. Like you said, youngest team in the league and a quarterback that loves not a rookie. We have to remember that. I mean, he yeah. he's not. He's in his third year now, I think. Third or fourth year. I, I can't even remember. He might be I want to say it's third. I think they took Love in 21. Like they, right, I think it was right after Rodgers won the MVP, actually. No, they took him in 2020. So this is year four for Love. Oh, wow. And remember that Rodgers, he became a starter in year four. And Favre was early in his career when he became a star. He wasn't a, a rookie, I don't think, because he was with Atlanta before. So, and Love, it, you know, I I really like the gunslinger mentality he has. And he he's throwing balls off his back foot. He's standing in. He's mm-hmm. taking the hit. I mean, he he has won that team over. And to me, the Packers, you know, they, they can go far because of him. They they can go far if their defense can keep making plays. And they – they they had a little hiccup there. They lost a couple games. Mayfield torched them in December, and then they lost that game kind of inexplicably on Monday night to the Giants. You know, they lost to yeah Tommy, Tommy DeVito, Cut- Tommy Cutlets. Yeah, and they got you can't you can't stop Tommy Cutlets. It doesn't matter. You just can't yeah. stop them. Yeah, and, and you know, that, <laughs> it wasn't like the Packers played horribly in that game. They obviously just you know they gave up a lot. They gave up over two hundred on the ground that day. So if the defense can put on a performance like that against San Francisco the way they did against Dallas, then I like their chances against the Niners. I do. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I said this earlier in the year too. Um, San Francisco or uh, Green Bay is just one of those well-run organizations that mm-hmm. doesn't lose. Like they, even when you think they lose, they actually don't like, uh, I think Pittsburgh is one of those where yeah. when you think they're losing, they're never really done. Um, I mean, who else? Uh, you really can't say New England anymore. It, it, that was it for 25 years. Um, Maybe Minnesota to a slight degree, you know, kind of given what they've – but they don't, you know, win Super Bowls. But No, no, they don't. Uh, I feel like – I mean, you – it's hard to not say the Cowboys too. I mean, it's it's not like they're horrible. Like, they're, they're there every year. They're always there. They just don't get over the hump. That I think that's the big difference. Um, but the Cowboys, like we, as much hate as the Cowboys have been getting, and they always will get. I think they'll get that for the entirety of the franchise. Um, they're a well-run organization when it comes to winning games, winning regular season games. They're never. It. it I really can't think of a year, and and especially like I've been doing a new video series on um, our socials where I'm going back and treating the NFL like it was the college football playoff. And I'm, I've been going back the last few years and I went back to 2020 when the Cowboys were like six and 10, but their division was so horrible that they were still fighting for a possible playoff spot. Like that's the, I, I'm trying to say something nice about the Cowboys because they have been getting shit on and shit on and shit on. And I'm just trying to make a little nice with, with the Cowboys. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. You can't, you know, I don't think firing McCarthy is the answer. I think the defense stunk. I think it should hurt Dan yeah. Quinn's stock is getting a head coaching job. I mean, they give up 48 points at home in a playoff game, even to a good offense like Green Bay. I mean, that's, that is inexcusable. I think. Oh, uh, absolutely. I, I I don't know what to say. I think Dallas just needs to lick its wounds and, and, uh, you know, impeach Jerry Jones. That's all they can do. That's. That is the answer. That is the one answer, I think. And then you go from there. Dak also has one year left on his contract as well. So that's something to definitely keep in mind heading in. I think heading into training camp this year and then obviously heading in to training camp next year. Uh, yeah, and they but, just looked out of sync offensively. I mean, Dak put up big numbers because yeah. they were throwing a lot. He did, threw 60 passes and just touched just over 400 yards. But it just never felt like that offense was really in rhythm. Well, especially he did the same thing. So at the end of the half, they were down, um, I think, five, you know, five, ten yards from the goal line. They were trying to score a touchdown. And at that point, you're touchdown or nothing. They were down, I think, 27 nothing 
And that the same thing Dak did earlier in the year with no time left, no timeouts. He doesn't throw it in the end zone. He, he threw it to CD Lamb, like right at the goal line, and Lamb was short. Luckily, there was a penalty, so it gave him one more play, and then they scored a touchdown to Jake Ferguson. But it's like those little mistakes, I think, at those times is really his problem because 20, I, I would say 20 teams in the league right now would take Dak Prescott as their starting quarterback. Like yeah. there's, he, he's, he did put up MVP caliber numbers for most of the year. I don't think that can be denied. And, and I got shit on for saying that. That, that, you know, I would defend Dak because his numbers were MVP caliber. His touchdowns were in the top five all year. His yards were in the top five all year. His rating was in the top five all year. Maybe it was against bad teams, but it's still in the NFL. Like, that's hard to do no matter what. Um, so I'm really curious how they're going to handle this. Dak seems to me like a Jerry Jones project. He's not going to let him go. He, he won't admit defeat because that means he's admitting that he was incorrect about right. Dak Prescott. And Jerry is not a guy to admit he was wrong. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. He summed it up right there. Yeah. Um, Dolphins Chiefs, the coldest one or the coldest game of the year, po- uh, like third coldest of all time. Um, first off, I want to talk uniforms. The Dolphins blue aqua plant pants are chicken shit uniforms. They can't wear those in the cold. They just, they don't fit in the snow. They don't fit in the cold. You have to go all white in the snow. I don't care about, you know, real football people will say, oh, what about the colors? It's harder to see. Aqua doesn't fit. It just, it, you don't win in aqua in the snow. It just doesn't work. Um, and the beers were freezing, a, t- a catastrophe. Um, I, I also think people were complaining that the Bills game was postponed because of snow. Uh, that wasn't because of snow for the players. That was for fan safety and player safety just getting to the games because there was a travel ban in Buffalo. Right. Like a lot of people don't don't realize that. They just think it was the NFL being soft. No, that was for safety precautions. And this game should have been postponed too. Anyone saying, oh, well, it's cold. Like football is meant to be played in the cold. Football is meant to be played in 20, 10 degrees. If the National Weather Service has to come out and say, you guys need to make sure to cover your extremities or your frostbite is is a high percentage that's a danger to human beings so i think it should have been postponed um the fact that they played the game i still think the result was the same it would have been the same no matter what um but it was it was very irresponsible for the nfl to play this game uh yeah yeah it it i mean it was irresponsible for the dolphins to play this game because they don't look like an NFL team. I mean, I, no. I get, I, I, I don't know what to say other than that. The Chiefs just look like they flipped the switch, but so do the Dolphins. I mean, they do this every year. Talk about a franchise that's broken, and it's always late in the year. It's never. I mean, it's pretty rare. They the one year with Brian Flores where the Dolphins actually started like one and seven and finished nine and eight. I think it was twenty twenty one, and then was they that to his first year? I think that was to his first year. Um. No, two was twenty. I think I'm pretty sure it was. That was the same. That was the Fitzpatrick and two a year. I'm pretty sure it was 2021 because they finished nine and eight. So it had to be the first year that they played 17. But regardless, Miami has always looked, as you said, candy ass. Right at the end of the year, it just (laughs) and they they just looked like it wasn't fair. It wasn't. I mean, it's fair because it's an NFL game. Uh, The Chiefs' defense is really good. We should point out that. If they're going to make a run this year, it's going to be a lot in large part because of their defense, and in large part because they're getting you know Rasheed Rice might be their breakout star. I mean, some someone new, right? It seems like every every year somebody every, has to be a breakout for them, right? Like it, it just yeah, has to exactly, be. exactly. And you know, you look statistically, and we'll maybe try to cover the Chiefs Bills game, but you know, they didn't have Pacheco in that first meeting with Buffalo. He gives them a different element. He really does, and yeah. I think for Miami. I, I think the talent's there. I think McDaniels, too. Uh, they need, like, a Parcells. To, they need someone like – and Parcells was there as a as a consultant at one point, and they actually turned it around a little bit. They need someone to, to make the Dolph- – the Dolphins need to pretend that they play in cold weather. They need to develop yeah. a grit and a toughness that they just don't ever s- seem to have. And so um, that's why this game was a mismatch. I'm going to tell you who they need. They need Bill Belichick. Yeah, and not be a bad idea at all. 
I mean, the the offense clearly has all the necessary weapons. Uh, Tua, the jury's still out. Obviously, I think that's he's a big question mark, especially heading into this this off season. It's I think, like you said, it's his third, fourth year. You know, this is when quarterbacks need to really show out. You know, that rookie contract's expiring, um, and and the Dolphins. I I feel like. There's just so many screens. I, I I understood what they were trying to do. They were trying to get those their fast guys in open space, um, but you just can't do that against Chiefs defense. You really yeah. can't. Uh, the Chiefs defense just won't let you get into open space. The the one thing that worked was that deep ball to Tyreek Hill, and yeah. I I said it when I was watching the game. And this is a dumb football take, but why don't they just keep doing that? Just at, at at some point in the game in the second half when you clearly are not getting anything done i don't know why they didn't tell tyreek just run just just run o- all yeah. over the field find an open spot i mean that's that's what travis kelsey does and until he's double teamed nobody can stop him i i'm not sure what they were doing with tyreek uh defensively i mean they were holding him down except for that deep ball but nobody can catch him so just run tell Tua throw it up and Tyreek is going to go get it I mean it's if anybody's ever played Tech Mobile it's what you do with Jerry Rice that is literally the typical Jerry Rice play because I'll play I play my dad against te- in Tech Mobile and I play as the 49ers and he constantly just goes you're going to throw it to Jerry Rice and I'm like yeah I am because he'll he's going to go up and get it in triple coverage it doesn't matter I don't know why they didn't just keep doing that. I think they got a little too complicated. I think McDaniel got in his head a little bit. Yeah, but they're not going to replace him. So, No, they're not. Uh, so, sorry to Dolphins fans. They also now have the longest playoff win drought in the NFL. I was there um, for the last one they won. It was 2000, against the right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Not good. Uh, and to, I guess a good transition, congratulations to the Detroit Lions. You guys have done it. You won a playoff game. Um, this is, I mean, I I don't even, there, there was an old man in the crowd. Apparently he's been a season ticket holder for yeah. 66 years. I was borderline bawling. Like I, I, I was welling up in the back of my throat when I was watching just his smile as they were kneeling out the game. Just what this team means to the city of Detroit is so much. And, and I, Kelly Stafford, <laughs> Like, get get out of the media. Yeah. <laughs> I understand Matt Stafford's thing of saying I'm happy for the players. Like, you know, maybe he's a little frustrated with this with the city. Um booing him. I think when they when he got hurt, they booed him, which is wrong. That's wrong. Um, but you can't expect to not be booed when you're going into the into a, a an away city. Like no matter what. I feel like that's just a given, even if it is your town. You gotta expect it. Like, gotta I mean, Matt Stafford has thick skin. I'm not saying that, but you got to have thick skin when it comes to that. Yeah, I mean, but look, for the Lions, it was just, it, this was all about them. And uh, I'm glad Stafford is healthy and okay because yeah. it, it looked scary. It looked like he was almost disoriented when he when he took the hit and his eyes kind of glazed over. Um, the, the Rams, you know, they should have won the game, and the biggest mistake McVay made all night was not going for it on fourth and fourteen. You, it didn't matter where they were on the field; they were going to need to stop Detroit from getting two first downs, which they didn't do anyway. I understand, but um, you got to go for it there. You have to go. the 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 secondary of the Lions is suspect. You had two great receivers, one having a, a an amazing night. Puka Nakua is this guy's, you know with him and cup and if you still have a few more good years out of stafford the rams could you know uh, go back to being what they call what the greatest show on surf now that they're in la um but the lions you know think about it i mean hopefully for them they this isn't the last win that they have but this felt like if it is the last game they win this year if they end up losing on sunday this will be a perfect bookend because this was very reminiscent of that first game of the year, which they also won by a single point. By the way, I wanted someone to fact check, and I don't know if they did, that the Rams have played three straight one-point games. And I wonder if that had ever happened. I'm just throwing out a random thing there while it was on my mind. But anyway, uh, you know, the Lions, this was the definition of finding a way to win. Because the Rams outplayed them. They outgained them. They looked, frankly, like 
I don't know if they look like necessarily the better team all around, but the offense was humming uh, for the Rams. It was it, the Detroit was doing it all early, and then and then they kind of it slowed down. And you know they've got those twenty one points in the first twenty minutes or so, and then they only got a field goal the rest of the night. But Detroit for so many years found ways to lose games, and they found a way to win this one. And that's the difference in the culture now. And sometimes the playoffs are about finding a way to win when you don't play your best. And if you can advance in the playoffs when you don't play your best, that to me is an indication that you have a chance to go far. So, um, and what I've seen, and I can just rattle off a few teams off the top of my head, when a team breaks a long playoff drought, I have seen a number of times where they then go on a run. The Bengals come to mind because that's the most recent one. It was 31 years, I think, for them. And then they beat the Raiders barely, right? They hung on. They just barely beat the Raiders. And then they yeah. went on and beat Tennessee and then beat Kansas City. And, you know, I go back to the 05 and 06 season. Seattle broke a 20-plus year drought, went to the Super Bowl. Chicago broke about a 20-year drought, went to the Super Bowl. I mean, a lot of times it's that first win that just is such a weight on your shoulders. And when you win that, and that's why I feel really good. If, I, if I'm a Lions fan, I feel really good about playing Tampa. Not that Tampa's a slouch. I mean, we know that they they got a solid team. They deserve to be here for the most part. But I, I think Detroit is going to feel great about getting that monkey off their back. Hey, we won one. Why don't we just go win a few more? Now, I heard this story from the Part of My Take podcast. Um, they were talking about Detroit Don. He's one of the super fans. Um, in Detroit, and there's a lady that that you know she's a season ticket holder for the Lions as well, and she has not been to a game since the Aaron Rodgers Hail Mary um, at Detroit. Mm -hmm. She said, "I will not go to another game until the Lions make the playoffs," and she just popped up out of nowhere, like what was it, eight nine years later at this very game. So just a cool little story, just about Detroit, and and just. It's it is crazy to see what the city means or what the team means to the city. The city and, yeah. I mean, especially how awful the Pistons are right now and yeah. how awful the Tigers have been for really the last ten years. I mean, ever since they I think ever since they lost to the Red Sox in the ALCS, that was kind of their their nail in the coffin for that whole franchise. Well, at um, least Michigan then, won the championship. So they Michigan, that. yeah, that, that's a big one. Um, getting Harbaugh and Harbaugh also interviewed with the Chargers. So that's big news. Um, but he does have, I guess he has connections with the family, um, uh, the Cronkies who own it. Um, but congrats to the Lions. That's, that's just an awesome thing. I, I feel like if you're, even if you're like a Packer fan, even if you're their biggest rival, right. it's, it's like hard to say I'm upset that they won. I, I my dad actually, it's hilarious. He he does not like Dan Campbell. He doesn't like his play call style whatsoever. So he was actually rooting against the Lions. But I was like, Dad, how can you hate that they're winning this game right now? He was like, I don't. I just don't want to see Campbell be rewarded for his stupid decisions. And I was like, Yeah, but it's Dan Campbell. He's he he's gonna bite your kneecaps off. He's drinking a thousand milligrams of caffeine every day. That's just you got to love it. You got to love everything about that team. So, um, congrats to the Lions. Uh, on to Monday, Steelers Bills. The initial feeling from this game that I got was that the Steelers had absolutely no chance because the the Bills were paying their fans twenty dollars an hour to shovel out the stadium just so this game could be played. I mean, if you're a Bills player, you got to be coming out ready to destroy. I mean, they, they could have beat the 07 Patriots, I think, it, just with the pure adrenaline that, that was probably pumping through their through their veins. Um, but they just kind of let the Steelers hang around. Like, they, they went up big, and then they did the thing that they always do. They let them hang around for a while. Yeah, they, well, this was at least a game where the Bills didn't play too stupid. I mean, the blocked uh -huh. field goal was bad. I wouldn't say that was stupid. It was just... Unfortunately, that just happens, I think. It happens, yeah. and it, and it kind of sapped them a little bit of their mojo. Um, what I worry for Buffalo is, yeah, they they played – they're mostly efficient, but they let the Steelers get some yards. There's some defensive injuries. There's some depth issues right now for the Bills that concern me going into that Kansas City game. But uh, Josh Allen running and, and going for 52 on a touchdown. I, these, te these teams – and I said we said this watching the Tampa game last night – these teams need to run more. 
they need to just try. They can't get frustrated just when there's one drive where maybe they don't, you know, have success because, you know, James Cook can can cook if it, as it were. Rashad White can cook. These guys need to. These teams need to run these guys more. They need to be less, you know, relying on trying to, you know, trick the defense or outsmart themselves. I just I want to see these teams run it more and. What's different about Buffalo this year, they, they ran it well, but, you know, those numbers are bumped up by Josh Allen. You know, if you take out Allen, they were 26 for 105 as a team, which is not bad. I mean, still 26 carries. But I, I still want to see these teams ground and pound a little more, especially when they get a lead against an inferior yeah. team. So, um, you know, I, look, Buffalo did what it had to do. If I told you before the game, hey, the Bills are favored by, you know, 10 and a half, they're going to win by 14. But I think what at least for the Bills, or, uh, you know, they won by 14. The spread was 10 and a half. So if I told you that before the game, you'd be like, yeah, you know, sounds about right. And I was saying that they played better than they did in the wild card game last year against Skylar Thompson and the Dolphins. And Miami got 31 points in that game. And it was like, what are you doing, Buffalo? You're supposed, this is supposed to be your year and the whole DeMar Hamlin thing. And then they came out and got shellacked by Cincy. But it doesn't feel like this team's going to get shellacked by Kansas City. I don't know if they'll win. It's definitely kind of a coin flip game, but I I think at least Buffalo avoided too much stupidity. So that's the good takeaway. The bad takeaway is you might have some injuries to deal with um, for the Bills and defensively, yeah, it felt like Pittsburgh moved the ball a little too easily in the second half, but not an egregious performance by the Bills either. Just kind of a standard, you know, this is just, sort of what we expected. Yeah, I think the the problem that I have with running the ball, and we can talk about this with when it comes to the Bucks as well later, but do teams, and the Titans were the best at this when Derrick Henry, Henry was like in his prime prime, teams forget you run the ball a ton in the first half because you want to wear the defense down. That, mm-hmm. That's the point. You're You're trying to wear the defense down. You're trying to grind them down. You're also, talk to any offensive lineman, if you're passing 60 times a game, linemen aren't pushing, they're not blocking forward when you're passing. They're moving backwards. And that can be a lot, that's a lot more difficult than moving forwards. And linemen want to be able to f- push forwards as well and use those different muscles. So I don't understand teams that, obviously, if you go down big, you need to give up on the run. You, you, you know, somewhat, you need to throw the ball as much as you possibly can to stay in the game. But it's it's really frustrating just watching these teams refusing to run immediately. Like their game plan, just no running. They're they're like, we're not going to run the ball at all. We're going to do it a little bit to keep the defense honest. But even the defense isn't going to stay honest. They're like, we know you're bullshitting us when you run it up the middle once every seven plays. It's it's really infuriating to watch, especially with a guy like James Cook, who's, I mean, he, he feels like an afterthought on this offense, and he he's not. He's a great running back. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it, sometimes these teams just, everything they do is backwards. You know what I mean, yeah. So. We'll and then Tony Romo also just the, the pure glazing of Josh Allen that goes on like, my God, I, it is, <laughs> it is so hard to listen to sometimes. It's just, I, th- I think like Pittsburgh got an early stop and Romo literally during the punt was just going on about, Oh, like Josh Allen is just such a great quarterback. He just knows what he's doing. Like, dude, shut up. Like, holy crap. And we're going to have to listen to him again, probably, when Mahomes and Allen face off this weekend. Yeah. He's going to be double fisting it. He's going to be going back and forth between the two. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. I'm now I'm starting to get out on him. I was in on him for a while and I was like one of the few, but now I'm like, oh my God. Um, anyways, uh, Eagles and Bucks. This was kind of a shock, kind of a not. Um, Eagles fans are, they, they dump popcorn on Nick Sirianni walking out of the tunnel, which no, we shouldn't be shocked that that happened because yeah. it's Philly. I mean, that's what they do. They're trash when they lose and they're like funny trash when they win. Um, I'm I'm going to give you a little bit of a of a timeline of the Eagles. Before Nick Sirianni, I think they went 4 and 12. The very next year, 
they went to the playoffs at, at nine and eight, I want to say, and played the Bucks and they lost. The ver- the year after that, they went to the Super Bowl. Nick Sirianni has never had a losing season. He's been to the playoffs every single year that he's been there. I understand if you want a coordinator change, Shane Steichen and Jonathan Gannon were both clearly big, big reasons why that team was as good as it was. But just giving up on a guy because of, you know, it's a tough season. You know, you, you have Super Bowl hangovers. Like, this This is actually quite common. Um, just the, the pure complaining and crying about it just didn't really infuriates me. Yeah, it, it it's nuts. I mean, this guy's won uh, 34 games, right, over three years. Like, as starting head coach, yeah. he's been to a Super Bowl. To me, it's it's – if I told you before – the season the Eagles would go eleven and six. They lose first round of the playoffs. You'd be like, yeah, it's disappointing, but maybe expected Super Bowl hangover. But hey, they won eleven games. They got in. You know, they right. It's the fact that it happened the way it happened. I think if it went yeah. the other way, where they started like one and four, and then they finished strong, and you'd be like, oh, Super Bowl hangover early. Don't. And then they lose in the playoffs. It'd be kind of oh, this is surprising. But this whole the way they went out, I understand why people might talk about Sirianni's job the the fact that they just they got shellacked by it. I mean even the oh Arizona game we said like it was the score was 35 31 but it felt like they got dominated in that game and then they actually did get dominated by the Giants and now they got dominated by the Bucks and there was some close you know there were there was a close loss in there to Seattle they were hammered by the Niners and the Cowboys and that to me was kind of the first time I was like yeah, maybe the Eagles aren't as good because they they just got shellacked in two games that were supposed to kind of be a barometer of where they were um, but I think it is absurd to even be entertaining the idea of firing Sirianni. I mean, if it happens yeah. again next year and they come out and they go eight and nine, or even nine and eight, and they don't look, I understand then because, you know, it seems like they were in too good of a position after last year to be going in this direction. But man, I, that's just typical Philly. I, I, I'm shocked and appalled to hear that, that they, were, you know, are so adamant about him being fired, but. What are you going to do? But on the on the Bucks side, you know, I was saying, could the Bucks be the one of those teams to go on a run? They've been hot. Mayfield played well, man. I mean, the numbers again, you could say because it's Philly, but numbers look good. You know, he's banged up, right? He threw for three thirty seven, yeah. three touchdowns. We were saying this because we watched the game yesterday. The the play calling was the, the one thing I came away feeling annoyed about. If I'm a Bucks fan, is that they just stopped running in the second half it felt like Rashad White four yards a carry 18 for 72 but like they they should have just been they should have he should have had 25 or 30 carries it's there was literally a stretch where it was like 15 straight pass plays and they just can't do that you can't do that I, I, know I think want... when when they go up 25 9 that's when you need to start just yeah. running the ball down your throat like there's no reason Rashad White should only have I think he had 18 carries total um, and the the entire team had 29 runs, but that includes like a, two Baker Mayfield scrambles, um, like a Trey Palmer probably end around or something like that. Baker threw it 36 times, and they won the game by 21. Like that's unacceptable to me. That's or not 21. I'm dumb. Um, oh my god, I can't do math. What is 32 minus nine? Uh, 23, 23. I'm sorry. Worst playoff <laughs> loss in Eagles history. Yeah. Um, the, he shouldn't have thrown it 36 times. That is insane to me. And it feels like any run is into the middle of the pile. They're, they're not trying anything on the outside. And Rashad White is especially a type of guy that you want him to be running downhill. You want him getting more momentum around the outsides. Because honestly, when you look at him, he's kind of built like Derrick Henry. Uh, he's not as strong he's not as big but he still has that derrick henry style build that can be really dangerous yeah yeah exactly i i I think if they're gonna have a chance to beat the lions you know uh on the road they're gonna need a little more of a balanced attack even though the temptation would be to throw a lot against detroit because their secondary is susceptible to big plays but you know in that first meeting they, they met in week six and detroit won 20 to 6 and Mayfield's numbers were very modest. The Bucks ran 16 times for 46 yards. Now, Detroit only ran 22 times for 40 yards. It was much more of an offensive, uh, much more of an aerial type day um, for the Lions. And Amonra St. Brown had a huge day. But um, 
interesting to see Cade Otten be the leading receiver yeah. at 8 for 89. So Tampa's just, you know, they're finding ways to use guy, different guys. And, and you know, maybe they're kind of – look, Mayfield is – you say what you want about him, but he's a tough cookie, and he – it, they're not going to be an easy out. I don't like, there's a part of me that feels like Detroit should just kill them because they kind of got that monkey off the back. But then there's a part of me that's like, I don't know, Tampa's, we, we probably should not underestimate them quite as much because they've been a very good team in the second half, right? The same way the Eagles have just sucked beyond belief for their last seven games. The Bucks have been very good in that same stretch. And Mayfield in mm-hmm. particular has played well. And those are the teams that in the postseason usually don't go out, you know, without a fight. So, yeah, it, it also felt like to me like this game should have been worse. It should have um, been. It absolutely should have been, yeah. Baker Baker missed a few. Well, I mean, he missed two go off his hands, yeah. Yeah. yeah and and like I, I think when, when we watched it last night, I said the passes weren't the best. Like they they I think both of one of them was well, one of them was definitely a drop. I think Evans definitely dropped it, but the other one down the sideline that was overthrown. I think it was. And even if it's Evans, like it's, it's hard to go and get that. It was on the fingertips. So it definitely could have been worse. I think if Baker can hone it in a little more, they can win that game. They can beat Detroit. Uh, that's. Yeah. yeah. So ESPN auto plays ads with volume. That's terrible. So yeah, I know. They have one of the worst apps and websites I've ever seen. Um, all right, we're going to, let's do this. I guess like our prediction, we'll do a couple minutes on it, um, and then we'll get out of here. Texans, Ravens on Saturday at 4.30. Big game for the Ravens. They're back. Um, I, it's hard, I can't, it's hard for me to pick against C.J. Stroud. It really is right now. Yeah, I know, and that's fair. And as a Ravens fan, I'm nervous. I, absolutely, when you have a, yeah, again, rookie quarterback with nothing to lose, no expectations. Now, but we'll see. It's going to be really cold. Not going to be like the confines of the dome that they played in, played indoors, right? Last week. Yeah. Um, you know, Houston's going to have to figure out a way to to get some balance. You know, running the football against the Ravens. You know, for me, it's just a matter of 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 the rust factor. I, I think when you just put the talent out there, the Ravens. If it was just ba- played on paper, it was just talent, of course. Would be Baltimore yeah. would be the obvious prediction, but um, you know, I think look the possible return of Mark Andrews is big. You know, it, it gives Lamar a trusted weapon. Um, he's limited in practice, so we'll see. As is a Flowers, something to keep an eye on. Um, yeah. I don't think this will be a blowout. I don't. I, I think the spread is pretty high. I I think the Ravens are gonna you know have to have to work to get through this game. Um, I still want to pick them because, you know, it's my team. And I think that they're, they still, at least until proven otherwise, are the best in football. But it is very hard not to have that lingering thought. 2019 MVP season coming off a bye plus a week eight, well, week then week 17, now week 18 game where you didn't play your starters, playing a scrappy upstart AFC South team. It's kind of, you know, you, you start to play all those things back in your head, and and um, and Houston just dismantled a pretty good defense. They they dismantled a team that beat the Ravens in Baltimore. So I think it's going to be close. It's going to be close. I I do. I don't think it's going to be a runaway. Houston clearly has proven that it belongs here, but the Ravens are the best team in football. Ravens have never hosted an AFC Championship game. I, I it would be a real gut punch if they lose this game at home to Houston. I think I think Houston's going to keep it close. Um, yeah. I think the the Stroud factor is something. It's it's a not um, you know it's not a statistic. You you can't. It's an intangible uh, aspect to the team. I feel like that puts a little chip on their shoulder. Again, nobody believes in them. I mean, Baltimore's minus nine. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be honest. That feels like a trap too. That that yeah. really does. Oh, it did um, definitely does. Look, I mean, first meeting. 25 to nine. That was CJ Stroud's first NFL start. You know, there's no way you can look at that as a fair assessment of how these teams are going to match up on Saturday. I just, I just feel like, uh, but you know, again, when, when you come off a fl- almost a flawless performance like that, it is hard to repeat it. So would it shock yeah. me if the Ravens ran away with this game as the spread makers say, no, it, it wouldn't. I just, you know, I know that there's a little more pressure on them than, than even in most years or even previously when they made the playoffs because Jackson has not had the postseason success. He's only one and three and 
you know, you look on the other side, you have a rookie quarterback who already has as many playoff wins as Lamar Jackson. So that pressure alone is what worries me about, you know, how close they can keep it. But the Texans, look, just want to point out, Lamar Jackson only threw for 169, and he was sacked four times the first meeting. Now, Stroud threw for 242. He was sacked five times. And, you know, the, the neither team really ran it that well. So you looked at that, that first meeting, and the Ravens, it was 7-6 at halftime in that game. They were up, yeah. and then they had a big third quarter, and, and that was pretty much that. But um, Zay Flowers, who was the leading receiver in that game, you know, if, if he's limited – yeah, there's a lot of reasons to think this is going to be a close game. I'm planning on also posting our predictions again right before the game. Yes, we're giving um, Houston credit this week. We are absolutely we are going to give Houston they can credit. win this game. They they do belong. And it's not that we, you know, it just look it. it well, the, I don't the, think anyone not. can blame us. Really, I don't think there's much to blame. No, I I think it's understood. Look, it's not. I don't think we're that shocked. I mean, I certainly felt like you know Houston could win. I just. Yeah. You usually trust the defense and, you know, the quarterback matchup maybe five years ago or 10 years ago, Flacco versus a rookie, you go Flacco. And it's not even that he played that. I mean, he had two bad passes, unfortunately, but the game, you know, felt like Cleveland's defense was the real shocker and, and they just got carved up. So we'll see. I, I think Houston Baltimore will be a good, a good game to start off that division round. I'm going to give my score prediction. I don't know if you want to, just because of superstition, you I'm want to stay away off. from it completely. Um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say 27, 21 Ravens are gonna win this one. Sounds um, about right. I could see that. I, I yeah. think I think it's gonna be kind of back and forth. Uh, I, I see Houston making kind of a late run at the end. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they score like a late touchdown with backdoor cover. three minutes left, and then they try mm -hmm. and get a stop, but they just can't quite get a stop, right. and the Ravens will will come away with it. Um, Packers, 49ers. The eight fifteen game on Fox. The Packers do not beat the 49ers um, in the playoffs, but uh, this is not Aaron Rodgers. This is um, Jordan Love. But I, I have a strong feeling this this year kind of feels like the 49ers year. It does. I mean, I, I want to pick the Packers. I want to say this seven seed magic can happen, and that the that the Lions can host the NFC Championship game somehow against Green Bay, and how great that would be. But Look, I, I think Green Bay, again, I think Green Bay can absolutely keep it close. And I think they can win. I do. I, I But my concern isn't so much love against the Niners defense. I mean, I do, you do wonder about, you know, on any given day, the Niners pass rush can just mess things up for a quarterback. I worry about Green Bay's defense because it's been inconsistent. And when you think about the fact that Carolina got shut out its last two games, but the previous game when it played Green Bay, it got 30 points. Green Bay's defense is very inconsistent and they had a great, showing for pretty much the entire game against Dallas. But it feels like whether it's this week or maybe they advance, but I don't see them winning the Packers winning a Super Bowl because of the youth and the defense. But I, it would be a great story, a seven seed Green Bay with Jordan Love getting to the championship game, and it would be kind of the, the biggest injustice yet for the 49ers because they have just gotten so close year after year, it seems like, and – haven't gotten it done. And, and one of these years you figure it just, it has to happen. I mean, they have to break through They're They're the heavy favorite, but you know, Green Bay might just be due to beat them. I don't know. I don't know. I, I think it's, I think it's going to be close ish. You know, I don't know. I like, I could see it being a game where the Niners cover just by sheer, you know, force of scoring a fourth quarter touchdown to put it away. Or I could see Green Bay taking them right down to the wire. Um, I don't know. I, I just don't know if that pack if the Packers can repeat a performance that flawless. I'm trying not to overthink this. Yeah, that much. Um, I'm looking at the postseason result. I'm looking at the stats right now. Overall, in their entire history, um, the 49ers are only up five to four mm -hmm. in in postseason matchups. Uh, they are up three to two when it's in San Francisco mm. tied two to two when it's at Green Bay. Uh, they have played each other in 98, 2001 and 2013 in the wild card divisional round 95, 96, 2012 and 2021. And then NFC championship game, uh, 1997 and 2019. Mm. Um, looking at all these numbers, the, the, the Packers are due like they're due this. It almost feels 
I've, I've now switched in this two minutes that we have been discussing this. I've switched. I think this is a new era for the Packers. Um, you also don't have to deal with Aaron Rodgers' bullshit every offseason. I think that's a new era for them as well. Um, I'm going to say Packers. I'm going to say Packers. Uh, I'm going to say Packers 21-17. Mm. I, think that's, I think that's a fair number. More of a defensive pick, battle. I want to pick the Packers so badly. I was looking at a stat that says the Packers, at least from fantasy, and I assume this translates, um, Packers and Bucks, two of the, the road underdogs playing this weekend, are two of the three worst teams covering tight ends. So you wonder about George Kittle and can he have a big game yeah. against Green Bay. I I think Green Bay will keep it close. I I do I want to pick them so badly because I, you know, sentimentally I want them to win. I'm gonna still take 49ers 30 to 23. I think Green Bay will get some points. I think I think it'll mm, You think I mean, the defense I, isn't gonna hold up. I just don't trust the Packers defense um yeah. to to be able to go on the road and beat the top two seeds and and do it you know presumably do it when your defense probably isn't I don't know if I could see the Niners being held like under 21 or 24 so it's just a question of whether Green Bay can do enough and capitalize on its opportunities I do think this will be a close I would be I'm I would lean towards if I was betting taking the points with Green Bay and I definitely think they can win, but I'm going to officially take San Francisco by a touchdown. Um, I'm just – I'm looking at their uh, – for the 49ers injury report right now. I want to see if there's any major stuff. Um, Trent Williams did not practice on Tuesday. Um, it just says resting. So, I mean, we don't know. Yeah. Because, I, mean, I mean, we saw what happened well, when, not- when they lost <laughs> anyone. Right. Like, they lost – especially Trent Williams. Like, he's that – he, I think he is the anchor. I, I think he's he's not the MVP of the league, but I almost want to say he's the MVP of that team because we did see what happened when they lost him. And we did see what happened when they lost Debo Samuel too. I think he's a he's a big guy who, who adds to both sides of the ball on offense. Um not both sides of the ball, both both aspects to the to the offense. Uh, he's such a dynamic playmaker, but I really think Trent Williams is the big the big name that uh, you don't want to see on the injury report whatsoever. Yeah. Um, it says, yeah, that, that all it says is resting players. So I don't really know what that means, but um, that's you, you Packers fans are really hoping there's some sort of baseball, like Chris sale style injury that happens over the next couple of weeks. Somebody gets in a biking accident right? or uh, somebody is playing with their drone and they cut their finger and yeah. for some reason they can't play now. Like that, I think that's what Packers fans are asking for. Um, to the Sunday games, Bucks Lions at three o'clock on NBC. Uh, that's actually weird that NBC has the afternoon game. Um, but this is, this, I think this is the tough, toughest one, really, because we don't know what we're gonna get out of the Lions or the Bucks. I feel like the other teams, you kind of know what you're gonna get. Um, obviously, it's any given Sunday, but it's a little bit more predictable. The Bucks. They could come out and lay an egg like they did the last two weeks of the regular season. Um, and the Lions could do the same thing. The Lions have been very suspect all year. Baker is a grip it and rip it type of guy. Uh, I think the Bucks are really going to hold this one close. I, I think it's going to be a little bit more of an offensive shootout. Um, I Do I want to pick against the Lions, though? I'm not going to. I, I'm going to go. I'm going to go Bucks. I'll say Bucks twenty seven or uh, Lions twenty seven, Bucks twenty four. I'm def. I'm taking the Lions for sure. I think get, getting that monkey off their back was huge. I I just um, I don't think they'll they'll blow them out. I think it'll be relatively close. Um, like I said, that first meeting. I mean, Goff was was just on it. They just neither team ran it like well at all in that first meeting, and I think. Somebody's got to figure out how to run it well this meeting because I, I don't know if it's going to work for both quarterbacks just trying to air it out. You know, we'll, we'll see. You know, Bowles loves to blitz. We'll see if Goff, you know, how that – how Goff responds to that. You know, can can Detroit counter that? Can they counter it with the run? Um, can they keep Mike Evans from having it? Look, the Eagles actually did a decent job on Evans. I'm, granted, he dropped the one, right? He, they missed the one. Yeah. It was Kate Otten that had the big game. Um, 
to me, Tampa Bay's defense is a lot better than I think people give it credit for. So I think this will mm-hmm. be kind of a slugfest, a lower scoring game. Um, I'm going to say, uh, I'm going to say the Lions get it by a touchdown. Also, I'm going to go 26, 19. I'm going to throw a weird score in there because the Bucks just played a 32 to nine game. So why weird not? Scores. We love them. Love them. I don't think it's a <laughs> scoregami, but I think it, it's a, it's, it's not a common one. Scorigami is getting overrated, in my opinion. There's yeah. been too many. I felt like there was like one or two a year, like the last five years, and then it's just the the inflation, whatever. Biden's inflation, man. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're shooting the scorigamis up. They scorigamis aren't worth that much. Um, and then uh, Chiefs Bills. This is the the premier game, I would say. Uh, Allen and Mahomes. There was a clip that just came out from I think a few years ago, and Mahomes and Allen were hugging at the end of the game, and uh. Mahomes said, we're going to be doing this a long time, brother. Mm-hmm. And and it's, I mean, definite. It feels like every year they're on some sort of collision course um, to meet each other. I feel like, dare I say that this is the year the Bills get over the hump. I, I said I was out on them at the beginning of the year. I said I was done picking the Bills. I said I was sick and tired of thinking that they were going to do something. And you know they're they're facing this is the weakest chiefs team they've had to see right like, since since you know um Mahomes has come in and this is Mahomes' first road game mm-hmm. road playoff game i don't even know what to what to say about this buffalo's two and a half point favorites right now but that can change like that i mean i so badly want the bills to win this game but i just feel like Mahomes is going to find a way to win his first road playoff game i think i think buffalo's they're thin the Bills are in the secondary and at linebacker. It just worries me that you know, they can be able to contain Rasheed Rice and Travis Kelsey. Um, Pacheco didn't play in that first meeting. Buffalo, I, I don't. Th- I think the Chiefs outplayed the Bills a little bit. Obviously, the Chiefs feel like they should have won that first meeting, if not for that Tony offsides penalty and Mahomes throwing a tantrum on the sideline after the game. But um, <laughs> I, I, it's going to be close. There's no way it's not close. But I see the Chiefs figuring it out and winning this game 28, 24. I just have a bad feeling that, that those injuries for Buffalo are going to mount. And then there's going to be one typical bills moment. And it's a shame because Buffalo's won three years in a row at Arrowhead in the regular season. And they've lost the two postseason meetings that, that they've had in this Allen Mahomes duo. It's like, now they get them at home, but they're on a short week. Kansas city's had extra time to rest. You know, the Chiefs are healthy. They're fully healthy. I mean, it never seems like yeah. the Chiefs have any major injuries. I know Mahomes was was playing hurt in the postseason, but he didn't miss any time. He didn't. And yeah. clearly, you know, it may have affected his performance a tiny bit, but even uh, an 80% Patrick Mahomes is good enough to win a Super Bowl in a given year. Even a 60%. You mean, you mean when they see the Bills, right? Because there was, I mean, he did leave that game against the Browns, and I think. Where he left another one. I think it was against the Jags last year, right? He, I'm pretty sure Henny came in. Um, yeah, I'm talking times. about. I'm talking about the Chiefs Just against having the guys Bills. without player. You know, like they haven't oh, had yeah, a year yeah. where they have where they've had to play without Kelsey for like half a year or in the postseason, yeah. right? They've had that, okay, they've had okay, Kelsey. Yeah. They've had you know, Snead left the championship game last year. He came back for the Super Bowl. They obviously Mahomes hasn't missed any postseason games. Pacheco has yet to miss any. They've been they've been fortunate. They they they've been very fortunate. Chris Jones. So Buffalo, they're going to need some reinforcements at linebacker and in the secondary. Um, it the, I just worry that this game's going to be Buffalo's going to somehow lose this game on a Buffalo mistake on a on a you know, Allen's going to try to throw it backwards and it's going to be a live ball or, you know, he's going to, it's going to hit off a receiver or, you know, or because it's funny because the Chiefs, when the Bills won that game, right, it was six and six and they needed that. That was their season, basically winning that game. They saved their season. And I said at the time, I'm like, that is exactly the way the Bills would have lost this game. Typically, Mm -hmm. right? What the Chiefs pulled the Bills in that game. And they know they didn't have Pacheco. I don't know. Does he make up the three points? Maybe. But um, I thought at the time, I was like, maybe if Buffalo goes on a run, we'll come back. We'll point to that game and we'll say that's the moment where the the tide turned, right? The Bills. Yeah. Just think about the Sunday night game. They were playing like garbage and doing all sorts of stupid things against Miami and getting tackled on the goal line in bounds at the end of the half. And, the, you know, but then they had the doink, the, the pass that went up in the air and the guy catches it. And then you had the punt return. And I'm like, 
maybe Buffalo, maybe it's, you know, maybe there's some good mojo going on for them. So the question is, does it end here? Does it book it or does it, you know, come full circle? Or I don't even know what I'm trying to say. Does it go like hit a 180 now and go yeah. spirit shifts back to does the luck reverse Kansas again? Yeah. yeah. And, and look, if you go with the do theory and what's due here, Buffalo's due to get past Kansas city in the playoffs. They haven't done yeah. it. Um, you know, the chiefs have been to the AFC championship game five years in a row previous to this. So they've never lost in the division rounds. That would be due. Mahomes never, well, he's never played a road playoff game. So he's obviously never lost one, but and when you're when you're like that new dynasty, the new Patriots, I don't know, nothing's ever due against you, it seems, until it happens. It's I, I keep going in this circle in my head of I'm making a lot of really good points for each side. Yeah. Because the Chiefs, Patrick Mahomes is the point. Like that is like the like he he does everything. He makes up for whatever. And and they've struggled this year, and he's still made up for for all of their issues on offense. Mm-hmm. Um but at the same time, I'm saying the Bills were dead in the water, it felt like. And then they beat Mahomes. And they fe- like it feels like they, they finally overcame this, this bugaboo that mm-hmm. they've had. I, this, is, this is the hardest game to pick, I think, in a long time. Yeah. Um, I'm going to hedge. I'm going to hedge our, the show's picks. I'm going to go with the Bills. Okay. Um, because it feels like this... This could be the game where the Chiefs say, yeah, that like those issues that we had in the regular season that we knew were going to affect us, they did. And, mm-hmm. and we have to go fix them because I, I almost feel like if they win this game and they go to the because the AFC title game is like their standard. Mm-hmm. That's what the Chiefs standard is, because that's what the Pat standard was. It was always if if we don't go to the AFC title game, we are wasting a year of Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. We're wasting a year of Bill Belichick. We're wasting a year of X, Y, Z, all these guys. If you're not going to the AFC title game with Patrick Mahomes, you're wasting a year of Patrick Mahomes. Like, it's just, it's a waste. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they've lost to can't, the Cincinnati. I mean, any given Sunday when you get to the AFC championship game. But they're not the better team here. I don't think they are. I, I think defensively they are. Offensively, I don't know if they can keep up. Be- and, and you mentioned how the Bills are thin in the secondary. But being thin in the secondary doesn't matter when your receivers just cannot hold on to the ball. Well, they're thin at linebacker, which worries me about covering Kelsey. And if he's still, you know, the Travis Kelsey that we've come to expect. He, I, just, me, he hasn't looked the same to me. No, to me, the, the Chiefs haven't had – oh, they didn't have any trouble moving the ball against Miami. They had trouble finishing drives. That's kind of been a theme for them. And if they don't capitalize against the Bills, it could cost them. But – Man, Isaiah Pacheco, if he gets ahead of steam, boy, this guy is a difference maker. And they the, somehow the Bills need to find a way to convert all their opportunities. They need to get touchdowns. Mm-hmm. Can't be settling for field goals. The Chiefs have not given up 30 points in a game this year. Bills have only done it once. So you know these teams have defenses, and they can keep – they can bend but not break. I mean, this to me, you could flip a coin and pick this game. I mean, these teams – I, I yeah. don't know that the Bills are the better team on paper. I, they might be. But the Chiefs might also be. And Mahomes may need to win a road playoff game before he has to lose. I don't know what the gods are going to have in store for us in this game. But I hope that they can smile on Buffalo, at least for this week. And I, the- I also think Buffalo being at home, just the, that crowd environment, too. I, I think that's well, I hope so. It's been a long time massive. coming for Mahomes to have to play a road game, and especially against the Bills, because this is the third time they've met in, in this era. So, But you know what? If Houston pulls an upset in Baltimore... The winner of that game then hosts the AFC Championship game. And my yeah. God, does does anyone want to watch Taylor Swift at in the AFC Championship game a sixth year in a row at Arrowhead that the Chiefs would be hosting? Oh man! So I would love a speech. little. I would also love a little variety with the AFC Champion. That's oh, also yeah. why I'm going with the Bills. Yeah. But I, I feel like just that home environment. But then again, it, it goes in my head. Pa- Patrick Mahomes goes in my head, and mm-hmm. it's like he seemed impervious to the like he's due type of guys like that. That's what it feels like. Yeah. But then again, I go back to the bills and I'm like, well, this is the first one that they're home at. Yeah. Like the Allen, Allen could be the reason that they win. He could also be the reason that they lose this game. So I'm, I'm saying bills. I'm going to say, fuck, uh, this is a tough one. I'm going to say a game winner, game winning field goal. 20, 24, 21. Like, 
I, I think it's yeah. definitely gonna be more of a defensive battle yeah um than we've seen in years past but i think it's gonna be really back and forth i feel like i've said that about every game mm -hmm. and we've had like tons of blowouts already in the playoffs um but i think it's really gonna be back and forth and and i think the bills will walk away with it uh tyler bass hitting the game winner from uh, i'd say 40 I'm, I'm going i'm going that confident i'm saying he's gonna hit a game winner from 40 yards out so all right um but well yeah, I don't. This is this is gonna be a great weekend. This is gonna it be a is. great weekend. Everyone appreciate it. Um, we have how many games after this? We have seven three games. more games. Seven three more. games after this. Seven games total. Um, so just sit down, watch it, rot on your couch, and uh, yeah, this is this is exciting. So, um, but thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, the whole thing, and we will see you next week.